Hello, my name is Nathan Smith. I'm a PharmD candidate at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy. I'm working in collaboration with Dr. Terry Warholik, Assistant Professor at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy. This is the first part of three presentations, which I titled Data Noir. They are intended as a review for anyone designing a research study. The objectives for these presentations are to define and to identify nominal, ordinal, and interval ratio data, identify the types of the appropriate measures of central tendency and dispersion based on the type of data, and to select appropriate statistical analyses based on the type of data collected. For part one, we will be focusing on defining and identifying nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. I thought it'd be kind of fun to compare statistics to a fine wine. It takes time to fully acquire taste for it. Understanding and appreciation comes with repeated practice, and it's always important to analyze responsibly. So why is this topic important? Well, choosing an appropriate statistical analysis depends on the type of data collected. This is a critical piece in designing your own study. In order to obtain meaningful results, it's important to choose the appropriate statistical test to uh, analyze your data. Data will always fit into one of four scales of measurement. Each type of data builds on the type before it. Nominal data is data that's divided into categories. Ordinal data is divided into categories and can be placed into a meaningful order. Interval ratio data, which we will lump together, and I'll explain this later, can be placed into meaningful order and the intervals between each value are, are equal and meaningful. Let's first talk about nominal data. The definition of nominal is of, relating to, constituting, bearing, or giving a name. Divi data that is divided into named categories or groups is considered nominal data. An example of this would be dividing patients based on their marital status as either married, divorced, or single. These are named categories. The values or observations of nominal data can be assigned a number. These numbers are just labels and they're qualitative. But they're often necessary they're often necessary to code nominal data in order to run statistical analyses. So for example, you can code any yes responses as a zero or any no responses as a one in order to run statistical analyses on your nominal data. But again, these numbers are qualitative and they're simply labels. Nominal data is categorically discrete data. <clears throat> it can take on only certain values, for example, points on a number line, but none in between. An example of, the, of this would be if you're simply counting the number of patients you have. You can, you can have 108 patients or 109 patients, but not 108.4 patients. There is no implication of order with nominal data. You may have insurance type coded as one, two, or three, one being Medicaid, two being Medicare, three being private insurance. Again, these are numbers that we normally associate with order, but with nominal data, they're just designations, they're just labels. There is no implication of order with these. And nominal data can be counted, but not added or subtracted. Some examples of nominal data would include dem demographics like male or female. And these numbers, if you code male as zero, female as one, the numbers represent qualitative categories with no implication of order. If you wanted to code race as one being white, two black, three Asian, Hispanic, four, and five other, this again would be nominal data. These are categories. These are numbers that, are, that specify different categories. And they can they have no specific order and they can't be uh, added or subtracted in a meaningful, meaningful way. If you had patient one white, patient three Asian, if you added them together and tried to average them, you would get a four Hispanic. And that really that makes no sense and has no meaning in, in, or, in relation to statistical analyses. Another example would be the number of people cured by treatment. A lot of times you'll see these types of uh, this type of information presented as a, a percent, like 76.2% of people receiving azithromycin were cured of their infection. 
This can be somewhat misleading because of the percentage, but if you really look at what where the data came from or where that percentage came from and what type of data it's based on, you can easily break it down to, okay, patients who received azithromycin, were they cured or not cured? So they fall into two distinct categories, cured and not cured. You count them up and then you can get a percentage. This throws people off often. So when you're looking to, at your data and you're thinking you may have nominal data, you want to ask yourself a few questions to clarify. Do the data fit into discrete categories? If so, do those categories have a natural order? If they do have a natural order, this is not nominal data, this is actually ordinal data, which we will talk about next. Are the data collected in numeric form? And do those numbers have any real meaning, mathematical meaning, or are they simply just labels? If they're just labels, you may have nominal data. You can also ask yourself, were the data the result of a count? Oftentimes, counts represent nominal data. Ordinal data is like nominal data, except that they can be placed in a meaningful or natural order. Categorically discrete data that has a natural order is what we consider to be ordinal data. For example, using a rating scale of 1 to 5, where 1 is strongly dislike and 5 is strongly like, would be considered ordinal, would be considered an ordinal scale. So a rating of 5 indicates more liking than a rating of 4, so you can see there's a natural order there, but we're still talking about discrete, discrete categories in that 5 represents strongly like and so forth. So with ordinal data, you can count it and you can order it, but again, just like with nominal data, you cannot add it or subtract it in any meaningful way. And this has implications for uh, statistical analyses. And there's also no meaningful information about the intervals between data points when you're dealing with ordinal data. The intervals are not equal. For example, the difference between four alike and five strongly like is not necessarily the same difference between two dislike and three neutral. If you were to add these figures up, add a, a figures up from a number of patients and then create an average or a mean, you wouldn't have anything that's really meaningful. So in this same scale, a mean of 3.4 really has no meaning on a 5-point Likert scale, scale where 1 is strongly dislike and 5 is strongly like. 3.4 does not correspond with anything because we're talking about categorical data. Other examples of ordinal data include attitudinal scales and Likert scales, and these are often based on subjective reporting. A lot of times you have like a strongly agree to strongly disagree, strongly like, strongly dislike. These are the types of scales that you'll see that produce ordinal data. Pain scales is another example. Classification scales is another example. So you can take something like blood pressure, which actually would be considered an interval ratio data, which would be considered interval ratio data, and divide them into categories. So normal blood pressure would be considered, would be anyone in your patient population that has a blood pressure of less than 20, 120 over 80. Prehypertensive would be anybody in the patient population with a, a blood pressure of 120 over 80 to 139 over 89 and so forth. So you're taking a measurement but you're breaking, breaking them up into categories and categories that have a natural order to them and therefore this is considered ordinal data. When you think you may have ordinal data you might want to ask yourself a few of these questions. Do the data fit into discrete categories? Same question we asked for nominal data. But do those categories have natural order? If they do, you, have, you may have ordinal data. Are the intervals between the data points equal? If they are, that's not ordinal data. That's our next level of, of data, interval ratio. But if you can't tell, if you can't see that there's an e there are equal data points, then you may have ordinal data. Interval data is like ordinal data in that it can be placed in a meaningful order, but it's very different in that it, the, the intervals between the data points are equal and therefore meaningful. Interval data is considered continuous and quantitative. It can take on any value, and it's quantitative. 
For example, temperature of a classroom, number of minutes until onset of action of a drug. The numbers produced by interval data produced by an interval measure actually have mathematical meaning. The distance between any two adjacent units of measurement is the same with interval data. When measuring temperature on a Celsius scale, the difference between 100 and 90 degrees is the same difference as is the same as the difference between 20 and 30. And these scores can be added and subtracted in a meaningful way. However, they can't be multiplied or divided because interval data ha has no absolute zero. And zeros on these scales are arbitrary and have no meaning. So 100 degrees Celsius is not twice as hot as 50 degrees because zero is not does not represent absence of heat. Zero is just an arbitrary zero on the scale it represents temperature at that point. Another example would be the interval between the years 1977 and 1978 and the interval between 1901 and 1902. They're identical. 365 days between those two intervals. And the zero point, the year 1 AD, is arbitrary. It's not zero time, it just represents another unit on the scale. Ratio data is just like interval data except that it does have that natural zero point. So the value zero does have meaning and therefore you can create meaningful ratios. Time is an example of ratio data because a measurement of time does start at zero. There's a true zero there. Temperature in Kelvin as opposed to Celsius is considered ratio data because the zero on a Kelvin scale does represent abs absolute absence of heat. But for all your intents and purposes, interval and ratio data can be lumped together. And we will call the data that falls into either category interval ratio data. The statistical analyses are this very similar or the same for both types of data and therefore it's only important to identify whether or not it's inter whether or not it fits into either one of interval or ratio categories of data. Some examples of interval, interval ratio data include blood pressure in millimeters of mercury, age in years, height in pounds or kilograms, weight in inches or centimeters, and number of days of treatment. You can see the, all these measures have equal intervals between the numbers on the scale and you can get a blood pressure that represents any number on the on this on the um, number scale seems pretty simple it seems pretty straightforward but sometimes the numbers can change and sometimes we change the, our numbers for for statistical analyses but we don't realize we're change sometimes we change the type of data that we have when we do make changes to our data so you cannot change data to be more than it is so data that is collected as either nominal or ordinal cannot be transformed to become interval ratio. How would you make the intervals between points in a Likert scale meaningful? It's just not possible based on the nature of the type of data you have in an ordinal scale. You can reduce the data to a lo lower type, however. Interval, interval ratio data can be transformed into nominal or ordinal data. So blood pressure, which is interval ratio, can be split into categories, like I mentioned before. So you put them into categories, you classify patients as normal, prehypertensive, or hypertensive based on their blood pressure value, then you've placed them into discrete categories with natural order, and therefore you've taken interval ratio data and changed it into ordinal data. Once you reduce the data to an, a lower type, you can't transform it back into interval ratio data. Of course, you can always go back to your original data collection and run your analysis that way. And just some things to be aware of when you're looking at your data and trying to determine what type of data do you have. Just don't be fooled by percentage. Is the result presented as a percentage based on nominal or ordinal data? That's what you want to ask yourself. If you've created a percent or a frequency, you always want to look back to what type of data did you have originally. And that's going to determine what type of statistical analyses you can run. And of course, don't confuse rate and ratio. They're very different. It is important to know the type of data and, and ensure the proper stats were run or are run when you're designing your own study. 
When determining the type of data that you have, ask yourself these questions. And we've gone over these already. Do the data fit into discrete categories? Or is it continuous? That'll tell you if you have nominal, ordinal, or continuous interval ratio data. Do the categories have a natural order? Are the intervals between the data points equal? Were the data the result of a count? Are the data collected in numeric form? Do those numbers have mathematical meaning, or are they simply just labels? And if you've added numbers after a decimal point, would that number make sense? I mean, that can sometimes help you, not always, as we saw in the percentage case. 76.2% doesn't make, make it interval ratio data. It's still based on nominal data. But a lot of times when you're collecting information and there is a meaningful decimal, a lot of times that does kind of hint towards an interval ratio measurement. These are my references. And in the next part, we will take a, we'll be taking a look at what types 